Okay. okay, thanks so very much. So welcome to this today's session. So primarily what we'll be doing today are Q&A sessions in which you get to ask questions on what we discussed about yesterday, which is on neural networks. So we saw concepts of how to develop your neural networks, how to design the structure of your neural network and the connectivity between them. And we also touched touched a little on activation functions, which we will get deeper into today. So there's a bit of like uh, drawing here. So what we are showing here, it's just a simple neural network. And we see for fully, fully connected neural network, each neuron at every particular point is connected to the next subsequent neuron in a forward progressive manner. So there is no, there is no backward connection. So everything is connected in a forward manner. So, and yes, so, and what we also kind of explain is there are modifications to this. This is not always the case. You could find an example is where you have like the ResNet, so residual networks. So usually there is a problem to that has to do with like getting gradients. So you have like a bit of different skip connections. So in skip connections, you could say you have, I'll just make you don't need to bother about it if you don't understand it. So you have like several neurons. So imagine you have a very large stack of neural networks that does some kind of predictions at the output. But the issue is, you know, with back propagation, you try to get the gradient back and make the necessary adjustments. But if these neurons are like the stack is really large, so your gradients might vanish when doing back propagation. So usually what people try to do is they kind of make some skips connections in which your neurons, so they kind of do some skip connections at some layers, just so that even though you are trying to do like back propagation, so having this uh, skip connections, so it ensures like at least your neurons don't fade out completely. So at least some neurons get fed to some uh, initial layers at the point. So uh, yes, so what I'm trying to say is there are several ways you could go about developing neural networks. So it depends on maybe existing strategies that have been used by people that work for them and also feel free to uh, experiment with things. So, and I think briefly I'll just highlight on some things with uh, activation functions, then please you could feel free to ask any question you want to ask then we could discuss them. And if anyone has some additional comments that wants to contribute, also feel free, please. Then, so like we said, activation functions help you when you want to have linearity in your model. And also, I also said it serves as a filter in most cases. So why is that the case? So for instance, assuming you have a linear regression problem, which might be a simple problem we want to look at. So, Remember we said, uh, yes. So remember we said like, when you have classification problem, you are trying to have like some kind of classes or some buckets in which you want to predict some values in. So in, but when you have a regression problem, it's more of like you have like an infinite set of predictions you want to make. So here can be maybe zero, one, two, three, up to infinity and here to like continuous downwards. So when you look at it, it you have several values. Your let's say your model predicts this, this, it could be maybe 1.532, some kind of continuous values. So it's that's what you call like regression. You have some it you could predict several values, is infinite infinitesimal values. But in some cases of some problems you want to predict. Maybe let's look at it. Let's say you are trying to predict some values with regards to height of a person. And you know, like, let's say you are looking at some, one minute. let's say you are looking at the height of a person in terms of feet. So let's say, let's say, for instance, I ask you what's the height of, let's say, the person. For instance, let's say, for example, let's say maybe Bala. So maybe typically you could say maybe Bala's height ranges between five to maybe eight to nine feet. So, but you couldn't, 
it is possible, but it's very difficult to say maybe Bala is 0 0.5 feet. So it's like a very, yeah, it might happen, but it's, uh, yeah, so let's just assume like, like typically the age, the height of an adult person is five to eight feet. So you want to constrain your model to predict this kind of value. So what could you do in this case? So you could put this constraint into was in your neural network. How could you do that? You could do that by using those particular activation functions, which could serve as like a filter to you and just to help you make those particular predictions. So one of the simple filters you could use is called sigmoid. So sigmoid tends to limit values between zero to one, and you could easily see how it does that by one minute. So what you have is, so maybe I'll just explain one concept. So we have what we call like logits. When I tell you something, it's a logit. It means it has like values of range, maybe negative infinity to infinity. So most times what you want to do is convert this logit into, maybe you want to convert it to anything you want. So for instance, we could convert it into some values of, uh, yes. So sigmoid values. So sigmoid values have a range of zero to minus one, zero to one, sorry, zero to one. So you could do that. There is like, there is a formula for doing that, which is like the sigmoid formula. And you could look at it in a way, let's say you have, you're considering these two endpoints here. Let's say you are considering negative infinity. Let's say we plug in negative infinity. I just want to give you an idea of how this works, so just so that at least you have some intuition. Let's say we have this graph here of values x, and this is the output when we use our activation functions. So for instance, if we use the value of, what's the value of x at negative infinity? So let's say you plug this in, you have one plus, here you could see you have negative value here, here, and uh, your x is a negative value. Then here simply becomes like infinity. So in this particular case, this e, it's maybe 2.7 something. So this directly gives you an infinite value, which is one plus infinity, and everything here becomes zero. So here, what it's telling you is at x, when x tends to negative infinity, like somewhere at the end of this, like line graph, your y is zero. So it's almost approaching zero. So we could just make some kind of notation here. So what happens if your, let's see your x is infinity here. I'm just plugging things for you so that you could see how things work in with these formulas. So let's see if your x is infinity. So looking at this formula to one over one plus, uh, sorry, one minute. Uh, negative infinity. So it will just become one plus. So like if you have a number that is greater than uh, zero and you raise it up to negative infinity, it gives you zero and you have one over one, which is equal to one. So what it's saying, like when X tends to infinity, your output is like the upper bound of your output is one. So assuming in your graph, you have, let's say here is one, this is zero. So what is saying like at some very extreme point here, yeah, so your value of Y is hinged at uh, one here. Then you have this particular kind of curve. So, and you could also try out when, okay. One minute, let me just clear this. So you could also try out some intermediate points. You could also look at when, what will happen when your X is equal to zero. Then you could see like this. So you know any positive number or any number this power zero is one. So this would be one plus one plus one over one plus one, which is one over two, which is 0 0.5. Then you could just pinpoint like when X is equal to zero in your graph, you would get 0 0.5. Maybe you could just mark that. So you could see something of the nature of like this. So it's giving you like a boundary between 
one and zero like we talked about here. So that's like how the sigmoid value, so it helps you limit uh, some value between zero and one. So you could look at in terms of when you want your model to predict some probability values. So it makes sense to use the sigmoid because it's like lower band, it's like between zero and one. So that makes sense. So there is also a variant of sigmoid, which I'll just won't go brief into it since we explained sigmoid here. You call it uh, softmax. So it works with when you have several outputs. Let's say you are considering some multi class classification. So it does like it gives the outputs of your, your prediction, like some probability value between zero or one. Just as we explained with this, uh, with uh, sigmoid, yes. So, and I think that's what I wanted to discuss. So please feel free to drop questions. And we also talked about rail yesterday. So in case there are any things you want to discuss about, then let me know. So in most scenarios, what happens is, remember we said considering just one neuron of your neural network, let's take any neuron here. So it's more of like equivalent to, let's see why it's called to mx plus b, where your m here is your maybe weight of that neuron, and this is your bias here. So, so what happens is this is linear. This is a linear kind of system. So it's a straight line. But in most cases, your what your model wants to model upon or try to predict is non-linear. So you want putting non-linearity into it. So I'm just repeating myself. So you need to use activation functions for that. So as we said, like some of the activations function you do serves as filter, one of which is like the ReLU. So here, what happens in your neural network is, let's say just immediately after the output of the neuron, so you put in a, an activation function just so that it could limit some values. So preferably what you want it to be just to add some linearity into it. So you could, there was, we talked about like the ReLU activation function. So easily, let's say you have, you could say it returns X if your, if X is greater than or equal to zero and returns zero if X is less than zero. So what's telling you like for negative values, you have zero, but if like the value of the input to the ReLU is positive, that's greater than zero, you get the same value back. So in this case, imagine, uh, imagine our, let me see, let's see, let's, let's say this is neuron, maybe layer, let's see, layer two, neuron one. So imagine considering the output of our, uh, one minute. let's see output of, let's say neuron of layer two, the first neuron of layer two. Let's assume it predicts, uh, so let's say, we have some, let's say, classic y, x plus b, and it goes into a ReLU activation function, y. So assuming our y is equal to four, what do you think would be the output of the of ReLU when we apply ReLU to it? Can you please give, can you briefly comment on it? Yes, there is an answer from Sunny. There is Sunny said four, Lukman said four. Uh, do you understand the question? I could repeat it. Let's say your neuron predicts maybe a value. Let's say you apply what's the output when you key in a value of four into a ReLU, taking into consideration this uh, these conditions of our ReLU here. If you pass in a value to ReLU, if it's greater than zero, it returns to you that value. If it's less than zero, it returns zero. So assuming we pass in four to our ReLU here, so what do you think the ReLU would do using this particular rules here? Uh, Abubakar Sadiq also said four, which is good. Yes, so four is the correct answer because like four is greater than zero. So your ReLU, 
your values have as a filter and when those values are greater than zero so it returns uh, zero to you which is which makes sense and yeah so for real it's a bit easier to look at it because like the values are direct but for other uh, maybe activation functions you will have to maybe do some kind of calculation and look at it but the good thing is you just key in this and your pytorch does all the computations for you so you don't need to bother too much about it so i think that's majorly it with uh, maybe activation functions so there's a question from from farida what are the conditions for choosing to consider uh, what are the conditions to consider when choosing activation functions? Okay, I think that's a good question. So there are a number of conditions you would consider. I don't know anyone that is standard off the top of my head, but I would say, like, first look at your output. First, maybe you could classify the activations function you could use based on, like, your hidden neurons and your output neurons. So in general, advisably, the general advice from people is, uh, yes, I think when you start out, just try out random things and see what gives you a good accuracy. But even before trying out random things, look at your output neuron. So what do you want to predict? Is it a classification or a regression problem? So if it's a regression problem, in some cases, and it's not constrained, like we said, it could be any values between negative and positive infinity. You could just leave your let's see the final neuron as it is here. You could leave the final neuron here without putting any anything here because you are sure it's like, it could be anything between the boundaries of negative infinity to positive infinity. But if you are sure like your value is a positive value, it must either be zero or greater than zero. Then it makes sense to, it makes sense to use like a ReLU activation function, which accepts only positive values, like we said. So that's also one. And let's say your predictions, it's also a regression, but it's like, it's bounded between zero and one. So it makes sense to use like your sigmoid. So it depends on the contents of your output for the output neuron. And if you are solving a classification problem, so you use, uh, what's the name? Uh, softmax that's if you are using a classification problem so your output depends the activation function at the output depends on like what you're expecting at the output that's one then within between the layers there are like several arguments of what neural uh, activation function to use but most of the default is towards what's in it most of the default is towards relu in the like hidden uh, neural network layers so most people just default to relu but there are other cases in which ReLU and sigmoid might not work. That's mostly in the case of where, so imagine in this, so imagine every one minute. Let me just clean this, just one minute. So imagine you have, still using the same neural network here that we have here, this neural network that we have here. So imagine this is your, hidden layer. So, yes, so your hidden layer. So here we have, for the output, we have like certified what we want. So, but for the hidden layer, imagine you are using a ReLU activation function. So, and uh, in most cases we said like our ReLU would be, it shuts out anything that's lower than zero and accepts anything greater than zero. Or we could also use sigmoid activation function in this particular case, which is like from, we have from, okay, one minute, which we have from like, uh, yeah. so here we say it's one, here it's 0 0.5 and here it's zero. Here we have like zero and here it could be any value. So what could you notice here? So what you could notice here is like for the sigmoid, in most cases, it would be lower than zero. And it could also, like when you do several multiplication of values that are less than one, between like zero to one, it's very likely you have like values that are very, very, very low at the output. That's like values that are close to zero. 
in ReLU2, you could see like it shuts out any negative values and giving it the value of zero. That means the output of your neuron most likely will be zero in most cases. So when you take all this into consideration, several outputs of your neural network will be zero and you don't really want that. That's where, yes, you don't really want that. And so here you could incorporate other uh, activation functions, one of which is like the can H activation function, which the limit is minus one to one. So it kind of helps in training. So in most cases, you kind of incorporate some tricks, some which have been discussed by others and some which you experiment yourself and try out things. Yeah, I hope it answers your question. So I think there are, so look at the, I think there is a comment by uh, Fatima, I think that might be a comment. Look at the hidden and output neuron. But if it's a question, please let me know. Okay, okay, nice, thanks. Uh, there is in there is some like message from Fatima. If it's a question, let me know. If uh, but I don't really understand if it's a question or a comment, just let me know, please. So yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, just try to experiment this. But for your output, it's almost guaranteed what you would be using as activation function for your output. So by, for hidden layers, you could experiment to try things out so and see the way things go. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. So it's a comment here. So if you have any questions, you could also add, or if you want me to talk about anything else that we talked about yesterday and you want more information. So like with these things, you don't really need to bother yourself much about it because they are already implemented for you. So if you could easily experiment with things, but the issue with experimenting with things is you don't have a very large compute or infinite compute. So, and you maybe since you don't have infinite compute, compute you don't have enough time to experiment. So if possibly you want to maybe make one or two experiments and you are almost guaranteed of getting the solution. So it's very good to know the theory about this. And I think there was a question also that we wanted to touch. So I will touch on it briefly and if you have any questions please uh, let me know that's in relation to sgd and adam optimizer so i will just explain it to you just to i won't really go into the maths concept because personally i'm not really 100 percent good with it just to like develop intuition of how it works then hopefully you could use that to maybe make changes on your neural network in so uh i think we we'll just let me just clear everything so so again, I think similarly, let's more of like go back a bit towards still considering we have like some, considering we have still some neural networks and that does some output prediction, that predicts some values. Still here you have, okay. Okay, I think there is a question by uh, by Bala. I will just answer it now quickly and before doing some explanations. So he asks, what's the difference between leaky ReLU and ReLU? So in ReLU, and there is leaky ReLU, which is a good question. So like with things with uh, deep learning and machine learning, there are several variations because like things are not, because some things might be state of the art, doesn't guarantee them to work for every problem. So there are always variations to that. So the key difference with ReLU and Ricky ReLU is like from the output. So you remember we said, like with ReLU, okay. Let's see, you are considering this graph for ReLU and this graph for Ricky ReLU. So from the name, you would kind of get a bit of intuition. Leaky ReLU, it leaks. So what happens in Leaky, in ReLU, we know that it accepts only positive value and shuts down every negative value. So half is the case for Leaky ReLU. So what happens is it accepts a positive value. Then if a value is negative, it leaks part of the negative value by some parameter in which you set. So here, remember we said, uh, Yes, so remember you said, we said 
if so we have ORELU, which accepts a value. So and if the value is so it returns a value of x if x is greater than or equal to zero and returns zero if x is less than zero, which is uh which is okay. But this variation for leaky values is more of like maybe I will just shorten things. So still the same thing, x, if x is greater than or equal to zero, but it returns like some, it, so this, I'm not sure if it's alpha, so it could be anything, but here it's like a very small value, maybe between the range of zero to one, I'm guessing. So what it does, it's more of like, it kind of reduces the, instead of having zero, like we said, there are several issues when you have zero. So when you have zero, what happens? It affects your output and it's very difficult to do maybe gradient descent or back propagation when your neurons keep outputting zero. So at the end of the day, you don't won't have a very good model. So with really key value, what it does that it prevents the output of your neuron to have like zero, multiple zero values. So it leaks some of the inputs so that it won't be entirely zero. So that's for leaky ReLU here in this case. So your alpha there would be a range of zero to one, I'm guessing. So it's just that just to reduce, just to reduce the magnitude of like the input coming into the ReLU. Uh, yes, so I think that's it. But let me just know if it answers your question or not. I'll also answer other questions before talking about some things, yeah. So I think there is, so yes. So there is a question from uh, from Farida, for binary classification, which activation is suitable? And there is also a comment from Lukman, which is the answer. For binary classification, you use sigmoid, because in binary classification, you have maybe one output neuron. So, so maybe look at it in this case. So you have, yes, sigmoid is like the direct answer. That's just what you need. But maybe let me just make a simple explanation to you. So yes, just consider this neural network below. And you have like several layers. And here you want to predict one output. So here it's a bit interesting because it's a bit intelligent. You just have one output, but you can be able to use that one output to predict uh, two values. So in what sense? Because let's say you are training your neural network to distinguish between your data set of maybe just assume this is a cat. Uh, I just hope it looks like a cat. So whether this is a dog or a cat. So in most cases, they are like exclusive to one another. If it's not a dog, so it's definitely a cat. If it's not a cat, it's definitely a dog. So with this neural network, what you use, what you try to use, like Lukman mentioned, is you have your sigmoid activation function. So what it does, it gives a range of maybe zero to one, so which serves as a probability for you. Then it could be that if the value it gives you, it's maybe 0 0.99, that means it has a higher chance of being a cat. But if it's low, maybe let's say 0 0.32, so it has a higher chance of being a dog. But you set the threshold between, let's say, 0 to 1. Mm. Yes. yes. So you, you will be the one to like as the engineer to set the threshold or experiment like for which values for which values greater than I don't know greater than a particular value would be like you would consider it to be like for a dog or a cat so but in like the optimal sense maybe just use 0 0.5 but in some cases that might not be the case so I'll just jump to the next question and so I think softmax function as explain okay okay Yes, okay, I think the, the comment by Lukman is the best one. So when you deal with multi-class class, for binary classification, you use sigmoid. For multi-class classification, you use softmax, yes. So 
I think I'll just finally just go quickly over this and just so that you have more questions. If you want to answer any more questions, if you want to ask any more questions. And please, if you just want to comment on anything, just uh, feel free to unmute and talk about anything you want to, just so that we'll all be running at the same pace. So what happens, let's... Uh, so, and your model predicts some output here. But we also agreed, like, in every neuron, there is... Every neuron has some med parameters for each neuron. And what your model wants to do is to learn those parameters so that it could predict effectively. So in what with back propagation, what you try to do is okay. Uh with back propagation, after so what happens first is your model does like some kind of forward prediction and predicts like the output here. So in back propagation, what you are trying to do here. what you are trying to do is based on like the output of your model so what you want to do is calculate some kind of loss that's how well your model is predicting stuff and from that loss you want to try to do back propagation that is get me from this loss what's what changes can i make to my parameter to make to adjust my parameter so that my model could improve so that's where back propagation comes into play. But what mechanism do you do back propagation? That's gradient descent. So I'll just maybe clean a few things and explain gradient descent. So oops. So here imagine, so we said like it depends on the loss, that's the path propagation depends on the loss. So what you would know or notice in most cases, your, your loss is a landscape and that landscape is, okay, one minute. So that landscape might be a bit convex. That's what you hope to get. If it's convex, it's easy to get like the lowest loss. So here, let's say depending on your, uh, depending on your, depending on it, this is your loss. And what you want to do is, and this is like your parameters, as your parameters is theta. So like your, what your model wants to do to perform really well, it gets to this lowest point here. This is like your lowest point. So assuming your parameter, this is assuming like your model just has one parameter, but you know your model has several parameters since you are dealing with neural networks. So assuming it starts at a very random spot, it starts at this spot here. So it calculates the gradient. That's something like the L, the theta. And with also you provide some hyperparameter, which is like your learning rate. And based on these two values, your model learns to perform this step. It kind of tries to perform some step, 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 based on your gradients. And it reaches the lowest gradient. And at that point, you say your model has converged. And it's likely and better than, uh, so it's likely like better than the previous steps you are taking. So that's like the vanilla gradient descent. But there are also two improvements to gradient descent. So I will just quickly highlight the improvement and also take your questions from there. So what are these improvements? So one of the one of the variations is SGD, stochastic gradient descent. And you would wonder how does it, it doesn't really differ much from this. So what happens is when you make your updates for this here, for the vanilla one, you use all your data. But here it's more of like arguing, like why should I use more of my data? Using all of your data is expensive because like your data can consist of, let's say you are thinking about using uh, tabular data. It can consist of billions of rows or you are thinking about using image data, which is very compute intensive to perform, to maybe perform gradient descent on. So with 
stochastic gradient descent, the argument is why not use batch of the data? Why can't I use part of the data and also perform uh, gradient step by step? And it's stochastic because like your batch is not, it's randomly picked from your data. So, and you perform gradient. So it's basically the same thing with this vanilla gradient descent. The only thing is like all your data is into batches. So you could have maybe batch one, batch two, batch three. And so instead of learning from batch up to batch n, so instead of learning from all your data at one point, so what you do is first take in your first run, you take like batch one. In your second run, you take batch two. And that way you kind of keep improving your model. So it's not expensive as the vanilla uh, gradient descent. So in the last set of case, you what we have is like the Adam optimizer. So the Adam optimizer, I would say it's a bit closer to stochastic gradient descent because in most cases it also uses like the kind of batch where it does like some additional improvement over SDG. So in which it has this special case of using uh what's the name momentum so i'll just briefly explain and please if you don't get anything just let me know so imagine you have a loss function in this case um, so imagine you have maybe a loss function in this case assuming so and uh, let's say you have you are considering some points maybe 1.2.3 so maybe you're looking at point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3. And what do you think is the lowest point of this loss function? So please just comment quickly on the, what do you think is the lowest loss that if you get the lowest loss, you would be good? Uh, so always feel free to just type. So there are no wrong answers. So maybe you have a different, uh, Yes, so I think there is largely answers of three, Lukman, Sani, and Abdurrahman, then Fatima, which is good. Like, because like, if, yeah, looking at it, like the lowest point here is three. So, so assuming you start at some random point here, assuming you have initialized your model to start at some random point, let's say it starts from zero here. So, and you have set everything out. So by... I think, sorry, let me just make a better plot. One minute, one minute, sorry. So, So assuming you have like some theta, you are just considering maybe one parameter, but it could be very more complex than this. So maybe from one parameter, at least you could visualize to when you have a very large dimension. So assuming you have a loss function like this, which goes down and yeah. So like you mentioned, Have maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So you said like three is the lowest, yes, because it's yeah, it's lower than one, two, and three. And assuming we start at some random points, let's say we start at uh, we start at this point. Uh, one minute. So we start at this point. So here you have set out your so. Yeah, so here let's say, assume you have set out some maybe hyperparameters. You have your learning rate, which is like some values. And you also, but additionally, when you are dealing with Adam, so it has what you call momentum, which particularly deals with like velocity. So when you look at it, imagine like this starting point is a ball here, which is rolling off this cliff. So at, as it goes down, like it tries to go down here. So if you check at this point here, let's see, this is point one at point, okay, let me just point A and this is point B. At point A, it's rolling down this cliff. 
But as you know, at point B, it will have like more higher energy and it won't to roll more. It won't really stop at that particular point. And when it rolls to point C, so maybe the next step is to roll downwards here to point, uh, to let's say, let's say this is point D. But as it tries to roll from C to D, it gains more energy and it doesn't settle at this point too. It tries to overshoot this point too and reaches this point here. So let's say this is point E. Because it has more energy, it also tries to further roll into point, uh, maybe point three, like the final stop. Even though maybe I have shortened the story too much. So why is this good? So imagine first you have a ball that is rolling down a cliff. So as, as it rolls down a cliff, so it gets more energy and wants to move more. So why is this important? This is important because when you look at this point number two here, point number two here is what we call like local minimum. So along this particular region here, this here it's like a minimum loss, but it's only uh it's only valid across this region. So if you are using like the conventional or vanilla uh gradient descent, your model would be stuck at this point, thinking it's like the best uh local is the best minimum loss you can achieve. But actually, there exists another loss, which is at point three here, in which you could find. But if you are using the concepts of Adam, so your model here can start at some point and gain more energy. When it gains more energy, it could overshoot this point at uh, point number two, and finally settles at point number three. So you could also argue that if it doesn't have more energy, it could not overshoot point two. Uh, it could like the ball could roll back to D, the position before going to F. So it's also valid. So like different things work, you just experiment to see them. So that's the idea of using Adam. And uh, people have worked with them and have said it's been good because in most cases, like your loss function, it's far crazier and more complicated than this. So like the dream of, Maybe any engineer is to just have a simple loss function that is maybe of this shape because you are sure like there is only one minimum point, but that's not the case. It's far more complicated than this. I think this is very more far of a simple simplification, but with Adam, it gets better with time. So I think that's just what I want to explain. So please feel free if you have any questions or want to talk about anything, please. So I think in the meantime, I will just, uh, so, yes, so I'll just wait if there are questions. So also in, so just to recap, like for the exercise three, I would upload the, the new, the updated, what's the name? The updated maybe notes for week three here. So I haven't made the update and I also try to mark the week three, week two submissions and maybe get back to you with the comments and what's it so like two things for the week three there are no additional or advanced exercises so just do the exercises inshallah that is on the website and for week three please we would likely be doing some peer grading exercise so for peer grading i would assign someone that would grade you like based on so you look at like the previous comments i made so you could just look at how like i made the comments and you would grade your colleague so which is good at least you'll be exposed to the work of other people and it's a good thing since you're all mentors so i think inshallah it's relatively easier so if there are anything then yes we will let you know okay so there is a comment by abdurrahman yusuf on on squeeze and on squeeze so maybe just to thanks very much i think it's a very good question so just because to increase interaction does anyone please want to answer the question Anyone wants to answer the question or should I just go for it? What's the difference between squeeze and unsqueeze? So these are like by touch terminologies and uh, yes. So 
uh, like we explained in PyTorch, what you have is you are dealing with uh, very large, most times you are dealing with tensors and these tensors have like dimensions. So in most cases, what you have is, and remember what we said about dimensions, maybe when you are looking at one quantity, it might have a dimension of one. When you are looking at maybe some quantity that consists of, for instance, let's say tabular data, you have like, let's say the number of features here. And maybe here you have the number of examples here. So what you have in, uh, squeeze and unsqueeze is just to reduce or add dimensions. So there is, yes, so I think there are some comments. So to increase or reduce dimension, which is very much correct. And there's also a comment by Sani to uh, allows for vector multiplication. So let's see in, let's see in the case where, so you have squeeze and unsqueeze. So just to give you uh, some explanation. So you know what, so in the vector, so vectors have, so vector is majorly, vectors are matrix that are a bit different from each other. So if let's assume you have a vector of maybe this, let's say seven, one, let's say five, and you want to do some kind of matrix multiplication here, so it's good to make it, what am I saying, let me see. Yeah, maybe let me not go this direction, one minute. So, so imagine you have any tensor. So imagine a tensor that has um, maybe dimensions of maybe, uh, let's see, four by one by one. And what you want is just a simple matrix that is maybe four by one, just so that you would multiply it by another matrix of maybe A times B. So in this best case, what you want to do is use squeeze. So with squeeze, what you do is you reduce the dimensions. Of your tensor. So with unsqueeze, what you want to do is maybe add more dimensions. Hope I'm not mixing these things out, but please, if I'm mixing it, just let me know. So with squeeze, you reduce dimensions, then with unsqueeze, you try to add more dimensions. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I have a question when you're done, please. Yes, please. I wanted for more clarity on these uh, uh, softmax and uh, sigmoid because I was thinking possibly when a situation of output of the sigma function was in the range, you said it was in the range of zero to one. Yes. Which on the thought of as a probability isn't. Yes. So let, let's suppose we have like a five output values of. Uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, mm. 9, mm. respectively like this. How can we move forward with it? Okay, okay. So you have like five output values, right? Yeah. So I think, think about it this way. So, mm. uh, so uh, yes. So let's say you are doing two problems, which is, let's see. Let's see, you have binary classification and you have like multi-class classification. So here you are just predicting two classes, right? And here you are predicting maybe N classes. So I think what you just need to know, like here sigmoid just acts on one value and assuming, uh, yeah. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So, assuming your the out. So, assuming you have a neural network, a very simple neural network in this case. So let's see. And the output is like you predicting just one value. So with sigmoid, it just accepts only one input. 
But in this particular case of multi-class classification, if you want to extend beyond one output, so you use uh, your soft softmax because it accepts several inputs and calculate the probability of those inputs. So in softmax, so it accepts an input, but this input is more of like, let's say a vector or one D array of a set of values. So this one D array, what are they? They are Let's see, you, are, you see you have like an output of five values. Just assume like your neurons are connected in some way. So this, so the output of this, you pass it into your softmax. So, and it gives you like, probabilities of all these five outputs here. So imagine, so what it's doing in the simplest case, the softmax is more of like you have, let's assume like the output of your network here is maybe, let's see, you have maybe 2.5, 80, 95, two, and maybe zero. Then what it does here, it, it performs like something like more of like an advanced sigmoid, but it affects each and every value. So, and it gives you probability distributions. Here, maybe it could give you maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3, maybe another 0 0.4, and 0 0.05, 0 0.05. So when you sum this up, it would definitely, when you add everything, this would be equal to one. So what it does, it's more of like an advanced uh, sigmoid. So instead of just predicting the probability distribution of one value, it predicts the probability distribution of several values in which most of those values are, the values are mutually exclusive. So, so it gives you like probability distribution of, uh, or between zero or one, what is your output of your model? So. So I'm not sure, is it clear? Or maybe should I, okay, one minute, let me see. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so, you, should, you should let it be clear. Okay, okay. So what you should know that like in a very simplified case, sigmoid, when you have one output, uh, softmax, it's like an advanced sigmoid when you have multiple outputs. So it assigns- so, but yes. What I want to understand now is that it's not necessary that, uh, when you combine all the probabilities values to get it equals to one in the case of softmax. Yeah, softmax will definitely give you one when you come when when you add everything of the output from the softmax. So like what it does, it's more of like a weighted, a kind of weighted average. So not really, yeah, a kind of weighted average in which how how good is the value compared to other values and convert them into probability distributions. Let's say you Let's say in a class of maybe 10 people and you have like the max of 10 people, like someone gets 99 over 100, someone gets 100 over 100, and someone maybe gets 20 over 100 or something of that nature. So, and you want a likelihood of who is the top person in that class. So you would use, you could easily look at the values and see maybe someone that gets 100 does well. But in the case where like those values are very small, incredibly small and some values are very large. So it's kind of intelligent to use uh, uh, softmax, yeah. So it gives you like a probability of uh, which has a higher occurrence or something of that nature. So I can say it, it, it calculated relative values. Yes, it calculates relative values of probabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's another final comment before we close, I think it's already time. I observed that in classification, we call for a function from a package for split, while in regression, we do it manually. Uh, is it a rule? So I'm guessing maybe you're talking about how you split between data. So I think it might just, it, there is no rule to how you split data. So maybe later on, you see how to properly split data using PyTorch submodules. There are particular submodules that are used for splitting data. And uh, these have like very highly customized splitting functions. And most cases you
can split data in various kind of ways and using these sub models, which is like under data sets. So there's PyTorch data sets and what's the name? Yeah, I think PyTorch data sets and data loaders. Yeah, so you will see how to split data in very advanced way. This is particularly important when you try to do like image uh, for loading images. So you see like very advanced way of splitting data. And because like in most cases, the just splitting randomly won't work. And sometimes if your data is not, uh, maybe your data is, what do they call it? Yeah, like if you have, your data is not uniform across all the classes. So there are other like techniques to split your data. So I think that's majorly it. Uh, please, uh, just to recap again. So we just answered some, we talked about neural networks. We uh, discussed some concepts on it and you asked some very good questions, which is really good. And uh, yeah, so the assignment is on week three. We'll be submitted next week, inshallah. That's Saturday night. I'll make the necessary update. Please bear with me. And there are no advanced assignments. And inshallah, like after you submit or before that, I will pair you with your colleagues or after you submit to so that people that have submitted, I will immediately pair them with their marking grading colleagues. So you might be grading another person. Person grading will not likely be grading you. It will be likely grading another person just so that it will be a bit easy because uh, it's been some, uh, I didn't know it would be a bit difficult uh, grading stuff. So <laughs> inshallah, you will help me out with that. So yeah, I think that's majorly. If you have any questions, please always drop on the group. Uh, and uh, like I said, like with regards to iScholar, it would be nice if you would submit an application because it's good. It helps people. It has helped me. And I'm sure one way or the other to help you. So if there's anything, just let me know, inshallah. I think that's all for today, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.